start. So uh, welcome uh, everybody to a new uh, season of the No Man's Land webinar uh, series on pre-modern Islamic manuscripts. My name is Bruno De Nicola. I am the PI of the project uh, No Man's Land, No Man's Manuscript Landscape, based at the Institute of Iranian Studies of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And here we are doing this project for five, for six years uh, on studying manuscripts from Iran and Central Asia between the 13th and the 15th century. Now, before introducing our speakers uh, for today, our speaker for today, I will remember um, you a little bit about the dynamic of the webinar. If this is the first time you come, we normally have a 40 to 45 minutes uh, lecture followed by uh, questions and answers. And you can participate uh, normally on the chat and the Q&A, but today we seem to have a little problem with the chat. So we're going to keep it to the Q&A button. You should see at the at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but also you can uh, raise your hand and I could uh, let you into the uh, room to ask your question verbally if you wish so as well. And I also encourage you to do that if you want. Um, so uh, these are the two options we have, we have now to participate. Uh, we will record this lecture. We are recording it right now. Uh, but we will not record the uh, Q&A. Um, so we, I will stop the recording once the lecture finish. Uh, today we are starting the first, uh, the first, uh, the new series that we will have six lectures uh, throughout the academic year on different aspects of pre-modern Islamic, Islamic manuscripts. And today it is a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce a friend and a colleague of mine who uh, we did together, we, we finished, we, we went through together uh, our PhD studies uh, some time ago, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, so Ignacio Sanchez uh, will be our speaker today. He finished his PhD in Cambridge in 2012. And right now is a freshly distinguished research fellow at the Toledo School of Translators, uh, belonging to the University of Castilla-La Mancha, and also his section editor of the Encyclopedia of Islam III. His main research interests is, uh, are the medieval Islamic intellectual history, literature, um, and the history of medicine and science. He has published uh, in a variety of topics, including uh, an edition and translation of, of the Iguan al Safa, the Pistol 4 on geography, and also uh, in Abi um, Usaibas, um, the best account of the classes of physicians, uh, that's a translation, uh, and also part of the team uh, led by Emil uh, Savage Smith. He's currently finishing a monograph on medical manuscripts and scribal practices, that seems, and physicians, which is going to be very interesting. Looking forward to that as well. And today we'll speak specifically about uh, this text of uh, Abi uh, Usaibia uh, on collation culture in pre modern Islam. Uh, and the manuscript tradition of the uh, Uyun al Anba, Fi Tabakat al Antiba. So, Ignacio, thank you very much for being today with us. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to, to give this talk. I'm going to share my screen, see if this works. Okay. Is it working? Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, we'll start now with. Uh, the talk. Um, so this seminar series is focused on the study of manuscripts and manuscript culture. So the aim of my talk is to contribute with a case study. But uh, I will also try to discuss more broadly what I have called uh, culture of collation, for want of a better term. So I have taken up this name just inspired by Anthony Grafton's uh, fantastic book, The Culture of Correction in Renaissance Europe. So I think it, it encapsulates very well what I'm going to discuss. So I will begin first uh, by discussing this concept, and then I will move on to the discussion of the textual and manuscript traditions of Ibn Abiyus Abiyas, or Yuna Lamba Diva. So I addressed uh, some of these questions in the two essays that I wrote for the first volume of the new edition and translation of the work, published by Abril. This was a collective work by a team led by Emily Savage Smith, who had the courage to put all these people together and, and uh, push to, to get it done. Uh, so my, my role in this team was mostly to, to deal with the manuscript traditions and the textual traditions. So by culture of collation, I refer to a set of uh, scholarly and social practices aimed at preserving the integrity of texts 
such as correcting mistakes, looking for best readings, and looking for different versions uh, if they exist. But I also mean, uh, I also refer to practices that intend to preserve the integrity of works, not only text, but full works, whole works. That is the, pres the preservation of works in the form in which their authors wanted them to be read. These practices involve authors, copyists, and readers, and go beyond the boundaries of the pure scholarly sphere. So I will discuss this point with uh, some quotes from different authors. So the first one is by a Jewish physician called him in Ayuri Cairo, Ibn Yumai. Ibn Yumai is the author of one of the first commentaries of Avicenna's Canon. Uh, and um, this work is, is a fascinating work and is still unedited as far as I know. In the introduction to this commentary, Ibn Yumai states that he approached the work of Avicenna after reading some harsh critiques of the Kanun. He thought that this could be due to a defective transmission of the text and decided to look for reliable copies. This introduction to, to his commentary is fantastic testimony of how scholars work in the 12th century in the Islamic lands. Uh, among other things, he said, and this is what I transcribe in Arabic and read in my translation, he said, I have asked many of the eminent persons who came from Iraq whether the people of that land have come across a copy of the Kanun in the author's handwriting, and if so, whether it was a draft, a Musawada, that he did not correct, as some people say, or whether he had corrected it. One told me that in Serta Madrasa, there was a copy in the author's handwriting, but that he had not checked that. Another said that the physician Abul Hassan Hibatallah ibn Sa'id al-Baghdadi, known as Ibn al tirmidh possessed a copy. And he said that he had compared it with a working copy of Ibn, Abin, Ibn Sina. He, that is Ibn al tirmidh worked on it and added his own marginal comments. The soundness of this copy is well known. It was sold after Ibn al tirmidhs death in Baghdad and was taken to Syria. So this is the passage that I have transcribed. So this shows not only the concerns of Ibn Yumai for finding an authoritative copy of the Kanun, but also the knowledge of the different stages of the text production, the author's draft, a fair copy, and a good collated copy glossed by Ibn al tirmidhi who was a renowned physician. Ibn Yumai comment encapsulates many of the questions I will discuss later, but it only reveals part of the process, the final end, so to say, the copy. If we want to have a full picture, we also need to look at the authors themselves. And I move on to the next slide. So I have not found any comment by Ibn Sina to illustrate this point, but I will discuss two further quotes from two well-known works that clearly show what I mean when I talk about the preservation of the work. The first one, you have it there, is by the 10th century author Al-Mas'udi. This quote is a threat and a curse, tahwif in Arabic, that Al-Mas'udi inserted in the introduction to his Middles of Gold, the Munuj al Zahab, and also at the very end of the, of the last volume. It says, if someone alters the book's meaning in any way, or removes any of the pillars upon which it has been built, or strips its features of clarity, or introduces doubt on its passages, or alters it, or changes its order, or turns it into a collection of excerpts, or summarizes it, or attributes or ascribes it to someone else, may he suffer God's wrath and receive his punishment. May the burden of his tribulations overcome his passion, and his cogitations fill him with perplexity. May God make an example for the wise out of him, a lesson for those who truly understand, and a sign for those who can interpret it. May God strip him of all the good he may have received. May the creator of the skies and the earth revert all the power and grace bestowed upon him, whatever his confession or creed may be, for he is over all things powerful. So this strong curse and threat appears twice in this, in this text, as I said. So al Masudi tries to protect his great work against textual corruptions, but especially against the work of compilers who made uh, versions out of these full works. It is not only a question of quality control, he is concerned 
about his memoria as author, about his fame and reputation after his death. And he was not alone in this regard, as you can see in the second quote. This one is by Yakut al Hamawi, the author of the most famous geographical dictionary written in Arabic, the Mu'jam al Buldan. So I read, the students have often asked me to summarize this book, and I have always rejected that idea. You should know that summarizing a book is like attacking a perfectly formed person and chopping off some parts of his body, leaving him without hands or legs or eyes or ears. It's like stripping a woman of all her adornments, rendering her unattractive, like taking away the weapons of a warrior, leaving him impotent at war. I have bequeathed this autograph copy to the library of our great master, man of deep and great knowledge, of immense virtue and great honor, Abu Hassan Ali ibn Yusuf ibn Ibrahim ibn Abdul Wahid al-Shaybani al-Taymi. He was better known as Ibn al-Qifti. So, in this case, we find the same authorial anxiety. And it is well founded because a summary of the Mujam al Buldam appears shortly after Yakut's death. But here we find a new element, a reference to the place where the authorized copy of the book was deposited, the library of Ibn al-Qifti. This does not seem to be a wax, an endowment. Uh, Yakut uses the expression ahdaitu, which is not the, the legal formula used for endowments. But it's important to stress that uh, this reference in the prologue uh, appears as if trying to lead the readers to an authorized source should they find textual problems. So he gives references to the place where the book that he wanted people to read is held. So since this series is mainly focused on the Iranian world and Central Asia, I cannot finish this discussion on the, of the culture of collation without referring to the most paradigmatic example of cultivation of memoria and textual control, the Ilhani Vizir Rashid ad-Din Hamadani. Rashid ad-Din was a polymath who wrote about many topics, including medicine, philosophy, and theology. He also sponsored translations and the writing of a universal history, the Jawami Tavariya, of which he claimed to be the author. He's also known by his large endowment in Tabriz, for which he wrote an autograph, Wakfiya, an endowment deed, that has come down to us. Part of the income of this Wakf was allotted to produce copies of his own works and also of their translation into Arabic, which were, were to be sent to religious uh, and learning institutions all over the Islamic world. But these works were copied from the authorized text that he endowed to the library of the mosque in his Wakf. And this is stated in the preamble of some of these manuscripts. For instance, you have an example here in the, the, the image. This is the, the preamble to the collection of his complete works, the Jamia Tasanif Rashidi. Uh, and it states that many excellent scholars have consulted the books and have commissioned copies of them. And that Rashid al Din also ordered to make copies from the exemplars held at the mosque of his endowment, where they have been put at the disposition of whoever wanted to read and copy them. So if a copist wanted to copy or collate one of these works, he could consult them in that mosque or use a manuscript that could be traced back to the exemplars held there. So the culture of collation then also involves the author who warned against the alteration of their works and provide indication about how to find authorized versions. So while protecting the integrity of their works, they protect their memoria as authors. And in case of wax, also the reward in the afterlife, the thawab, which is a, a religious reward. So now let's move to the general, to the particular. So in this paper, I'm going to discuss a work on the history of medicine. What does it entail to control and protect texts and works in pre-modern medicine? So I will also illustrate this point with two quotations. The first one is from Abu Bakr al-Rasi, the famous physician, who complained about the problems of dealing with works of Materia Medica. So I'm reading here uh, Oliver Kahl's translation of uh, Kitab al-Hawi. So the authors of these books and prescriptions do not care whether they represent the drug names in such forms as can be verified in the source languages. Rather, they pen them down with utmost negligence and nonchalance and distort them through different kinds of spelling so that one and the same word appears written in several ways. So Arasi refers to authors, not copies, but you can imagine that these problems multiply as the books are copied. 
not only when it comes to render foreign plant names, but also foreign proper names and terms borrowed from Greek and Indian medical traditions, which are common in medical literature. So the second quotation dwells on the same problem denounced by Almazodi and Yakut. So the work may be corrupted when it is accepted or summarized as, as they said. So even Ridwan was a Fatimid physician well known for his rejection of this kind of secondary literature, namely Kananish, so handbooks, Yawamia, summaries, and Tafasir, commentaries. His epistle on the excellence of medicine, Risala Fishravatib, has chapters criticizing each one of these genre. Concerning the summaries of Galenic works, he says, many authors of summaries included in the writing things that have nothing to do with what Galen said. These summaries do not convey the ideas contained in the book of Galen, and there is nothing profitable in them. When the student reads them, he is turned away from the truth, and what he retains in his soul is not that which Galen thought, uh, saw in his books. These summaries are an obstacle to learn. The life of the student is weighted with them before he attains any goal. So all these quotations that I've read reveal, I hope, the extent of some of the problems that pre-modern authors, copyists, and readers had to face. Also, their concerns about the proper transmission of text and the integrity of works. So after this broad contextualization, I will now move to a case study. So Ibn Abu Yusebias or Joan al and I've chosen this, this text because I know it very well, and uh, because the manuscripts of this work are perfect to see how many of these questions were addressed in the practice. So, Ibn Abu Sabiya was a Syrian physician, mostly known for the Oyunal Ambafi Tabakata Ratiba, so the best accounts of the best sources on the classes of physicians. This is a work on the history of medicine and philosophy written as a collection of biographies. He also uh, wrote uh, medical works, but uh, none of them has come down to us. Uh, he was a physician himself, as you can see here in the slide, and worked in, in different hospitals. But he's mainly known as an author of this history of, of medicine. The Uyuna Amba Fitabakala is a large work with a very complex, complex textual and manuscript tradition. This work circulated in three different versions written by the author himself. It will take more time to discuss this in detail, but uh, I will only give some general ideas that will be clearer afterwards with the discussion of the manuscripts. So the first editor of the work, August Müller, studied the textual trans trans tradition of the Yolamba in his introduction to the edition. He concluded that there were two versions that could be traced back to Ibn Abi Yusabiyah. And this is something that Ibn Abi Yusabiyah himself says in, in, in the text, because he talks about the previous version. Additionally, Müller claimed that there was a, a later third version that he thought was um, a combination of Ibn Abi Yusabiyah's original work and posthumous additions that were not part of the original. So Müller, did an amazing job. He asked the right questions and his conclusions were logical in view of the information that he had. But he was confused by one of the manuscripts that he used, uh, which referred to a, a draft copy. It was a manuscript uh, held in Cambridge that I will discuss later. Uh, all these uh, problems were solved when the, a colleague of ours, Peter Starr, found about 10 years ago uh, another manuscript in Istanbul, the manuscript Shahid Ali Pasha, 1923, which is the most important manuscript for our edition of uh, uh, Ibn Amisabia in, in Brill. So you can see here some photographs. The, the messy one is uh, Ibn, the, this Istanbul manuscript. So the Oyunamba Fitbakabar Atiba is a large work with a very complex textual manuscript tradition, as I said. Um, now we know that uh, there are three versions and not two, as, uh, as uh, Müller said, three versions that can be traced back to Ibn Abi Sabia, to the author. So there's no uh, additions after his, his death. So the three go back to the author. These, threes are, these three versions are a first version written in 1243 for uh, Amin al-Dawla, and then two later versions 
which circulated at the same time, and they were finished around 1269. The second version has more biographies than the first one, but some brief biographies of version one are missing there. And version three recovers all the missing biographies and adds some more extra information. So in numbers, version one has about 350 biographies, version two, 365, and version three, 433. Up to chapter seven, the text is the same in all of them. It covers the ancient medicine and, and the Greek tradition. But uh, they start to differ when Ibn Ibn discusses medicine in the Islamic lands. So how can we know that? We know that because the Istanbul Shehi Ali Pasha manuscript, the one in, in, in yellow that you can see, um, has at the same time two versions of the text. One taken from an exemplar copy from an autograph of, by Ibn Ibn and one taken from the author's draft. I will discuss this later, but if you look at the image now, you see uh, like a, a normal layout text, and then it goes around. So these are two textual levels that uh, can be traced to two different versions. Okay, so there's also a, a manuscript uh, in the British Library, which was copied uh, one year after Ibn Musabia's death from uh, a copy that the author himself lets, left as waqf in the Dar al-Hadith of Ibn Uruwa. It only has chapters 14 and 15, but it's enough to see that this text matches the version that, that we find in the Istanbul manuscript. And uh, it solves the problem about the authorship of the, of the work. Um, so from this, just keep in mind that there are three versions of the text and that um, uh, these three can be found today in the in, in manuscripts in all libraries. They are pretty much, I would say that uh, of all the manuscripts I have checked, and we use more than 30 for the, for the edition, about 20% belong to version one, and then 40 and 40 to uh, versions two and three, okay? So let's look at this, this manuscript. Um, I say is this is the key to understand the, all the, the manuscript tradition. Um, it was written in 1372, and uh, it's a perfect example of the culture of collation that I have discussed before. But it has its own story. So the copies of this manuscript first searched for an exemplar that could be traced back to the author, and he found it, as he states in the colophon. Uh, he copied it, and this is what you can see as the main body text. So the well laid out text in the in the in the page. This goes back to a copy of an autograph, as he says in the in the colophon. Uh, the text is full of foreign names and presents many problems. And probably because of that, the copy searched for another manuscript to collate his own copy. And the manuscript that he found was Ibn Abi Sabia's own draft, Musawada in Arabic. Um, so, but this draft contains a different version of the work, which has uh, additions um, about 17 more biographies. So this new additional text is what you find in the margins. You will see it better. So you have another image here. So the layout of the body text, which was the first copy that the author made, that the copies made, and then all the additions. So to summarize, you have here in, in red, it's the, the copy, the first copy that the, the copy is made. And it goes back to a copy of an autograph, but this belongs to version two of the text. And then he went to find uh, a text to collate his own copy. And what he found was a musawada, a draft, which belonged to the third version of the text. So when he started collating them, he realized eventually that they belong to different traditions, textual traditions, so there were different versions. So he added all these new informations in the margins. And you can see here that we have uh, as the main body text is the version two of the of the EB of the Yunamba. And then all the additions are the extra text that you find in version three. So version two and version three share the main body text. 
So the, the red one is shared by both, but version three has additions. And this is what you find in the margins and in interleaves. So in sum, so the main body text is version two and main body text plus all the additions is version three. Before I said that there are three versions of the text, it's true that the, this manuscript only uses two. So I'm going to talk only about version two and version three. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So, so let's take a look, take a look at, at, the, at the copiest. Uh, so we don't know much about the copies. We know his name, Abdel Hadi Ibn Abil Mufaddal Ibn Abil Farash. And uh, it is not unlikely that he was a physician himself. In any case, he was acquainted with the kind of literature used by Ibn Abiyah, as you can see in these two marginal notes. So he added some notes on his own to complement the text or, or to reinforce some of the ideas that uh, Ibn Abiyah uh, includes in his text. And in this case, it's one from Ibn Mutran, who was a physician, and Al Mubashir ibn Fatik is the author of uh, a famous uh, work on, on wisdom. Uh, so he, he was aware of this text and he, he knew how to look for these uh, quotes and, and copy them. So that's why he was probably a physician or someone very uh, well read, at least in this kind of, of, of literature. There are not many of these uh, marginalia. They are, appear at the beginning of the text, but soon the author realizes that he needs to use the margins for something different and stopped adding his own information. And um, we're going to discuss it now. Um, the copies left uh, information about his method and about the manuscript that he was using. So that's why we can sort out these two kinds of, of versions. So it seems that he did not realize that he was dealing with different versions until he had compared a third of the work. So the first uh, chapters, as I said, are similar in all three versions. They deal with uh, the Greek tradition, with philosophy. So there are no differences in the text. But when Ibn Sophia start writing about the Islamic world and, and physicians living in the Islamic world, there are differences there. So the first third of the, of the manuscript has hardly any references. And then in folio 120, we find the first collation mark. So these are these kind of, of Mubaka, Mukabala uh, marks. So it's a, uh, I uh, collated the text and I checked this against the, the exemplar of the author. He uses different terms to refer to, to the copy that he was using for collation. Something referred to the, the, the copy of the, of the author. And at some point he starts talking about the, the, the Musawada, the, the, the draft. So, he also, uh, you see also that the, the collation marks only affect part of the manuscript. They start in folio 120 and they go up to folio 288. So the, the manuscript has more than 300. But this is the part when you see the differences between both versions. And this is what he uh, uh, marks as collation. So you have listed here all the collation marks that you find. They are around, uh, I mean, usually, each 20 folios, you have one between 120 and 288. So this is very useful to, to understand what he was doing. But um, the copies, uh, in fact, explains what he was doing at different points. Uh, the first explanation, of course, in folio 102, uh, 20 folios before the first collation mark, where he writes in the margin. This is what you find here at the, the left-hand side. So I found an addition in another copy, which I have added before it. So I did in an interleaf. And you can see the right-hand side, the interleaf with all the addition. And this is marked with this Hadihit Siyada. So this is the addition. So this is the first time that he realized that the, there's a difference between both versions. And he marks this in the text and adds the new information, the new text in a separate interleaf. Um, later on, we find a second explanation 
in this case, very detailed. So you can see it written in, in this image, uh, in the left margin, it starts the hashia and then goes around the, the margin and goes down. Uh, in, this, uh, in this marginal note, the copies refers to the first that he, the first, the first text that he copied. He calls it al-Nusha Mankul Minha, which is the body text, as, as I said before, the, the red part that I showed. And then he also refers to the second manuscript used for collation, the draft. So I read the, the note. Uh, the reader of this man, marginal note says, I found in the draft of the author, the Musawada, names that were not in the exemplar copy, which is the, the main body text. This exemplar is a copy that was transcribed from a copy also written by the author in his own hand. It occurred to me that he omitted names in the fair copy, so the body text, because he intended to compose an abridgment since he omitted names since the omitted names are of no benefits or for some other reason. I did not want this copy, this is his own copy, to lack a single name from among those found in Ibn Mesiria's draft. I have included whatever was not present in the exemplar in the preceding chapters of this book in this copy. Each name at the point where the author mentioned it in his draft, out of concern that the copies of this of his first copy uh, again, the body text had omitted them. And now it had occurred to me that I should include all of the names present in the author's draft following one another in lists and indicate their positions in the text as far as I'm capable and able to do so. From God, I ask assistance in this. So the reduction is a bit convoluted, but uh, uh, here we can see that he's fully aware now that he's dealing with two different versions of the text. The first one, is the one that he copied first, the, body the main body text, which he interprets as a possible abridgment or as a defective copy. And then he has a draft, which is the, the, the manuscript he's using for collation, which contains a larger version of the work. And he informs the reader of his copy and about his method, so stressing the need to respect the order of the biographies and he even mentioned his intention to write lists of the names that uh, sadly have not come down to us. So he mentioned that he was going to write some lists, but we don't, we don't have them. Um, let's see one of these examples to, to see how it works. Um, here you see one page from the chapter of Al-Andalus. Uh, the main body text is version two, and uh, in the chapter of Alamnes, uh, there are several brief biographies that are lacking, but they appear later in the draft that he was using for collation. And what he does is just to mark, you see the, the, the arrow here, he makes a mark and he adds the biography in the margin. And you have a full biography, for instance, here is uh, Abu Jafar, Ahmad ibn Hamis, ibn Amir, ibn Dominj, Domingo, probably. So biography, which was lacking in version two. So the version of the main body text is added from the draft in the margin. He explains this further in the colophon um, at the very end of, of the work. And um, again, he, he refers to his method and, and the use of two different manuscripts. So I read, the copyist says, Praise be to God and blessings on his prophet and his family. I have meticulously collated this copy with the copy of the author to the best of my efforts. Then I found in the draft of the author in his handwriting things that he had not included in the autograph exemplar that he presented and dedicated to important people. So I included this in order to preserve what he reports and to encompass all knowledge. I reached up to the biography of Sahib Amina Daula al Ghazal. And I found that this copy had mainly ad many additions in the biography under his name and in the following. I abandoned the collection from this point onwards since there is no extra material. So this statement is a bit misleading because it refers to additions after Amina Daula's biography when it was said before. So this is, I think, simply a mistake as we can see in the manuscript. 
and, and in the collection of Mark. If you remember when I listed them, so was the, the list of, oh, here. So they go from 120 up to Amina Daula. So from this point, there are no major uh, differences. So he stops adding these this marks. And this is what he said in the in this call of um, So I'm going now to, <clears throat> in addition to this explanation, the, the copies added uh, further reading and copying instructions because he realized that uh, his copy was rather messy with all these additions. So some of them are the usual marks uh, referring to marginal additions and emendations. So you have here one, one example is similar to, to the one we saw before. So after Abil Abbas, you have this carrot, this mark, which uh, refers to, to the addition in the, in the margin. So this is something that you find in all kinds of manuscripts. But uh, in many instances, uh, the copies refers to the order of biographies. He was very concerned about the order because it, it was difficult to, to grasp the way in which uh, the biographies follow one each other in the margins. So he added his own explanations. For instance, at the beginning of the chapter on Egypt, this is chapter 14, uh, we find this explanation concerning some additional material added in an interleaf and also expressing doubt about the order of some biographies. And you can read here that uh, the copy says, in the draft, the author put all these names one after another from the beginning of the chapter, but Validia, is the, the name of one of the physicians, was written in the margin. And I don't know in which position should it be placed. After these names, the author placed Albalisi in the asal. I mean, this is the asal here refers to the, the, the copy used in the main body text, so version two. But in the draft, he does not appear after these names. Be aware of that. So he warns the reader or the father copies about uh, problems in the order of the biographies because he could not solve them. Uh, he also gives uh, comments on, on other, other problems. For instance, uh, he talks about the missing name that's, that was cut off by the binder or about the disagreement between the order of biographies in both versions of the text. So you can read them here and they correspond with these two marginal notes in, in the images. So one of them says that this name, a biography, is following the draft by another name written in the margin that was cut off by the binder. It was a brief biography that cannot be read. So he, he says that there's something missing there. Um, and again, when he says uh, a problem, I did not find it in this place in the author draft. So there's a discrepancy between the order in the main body text, which is version two, and the order in the author's draft, which is version three. So the method of the copies also allowed us to sort out these two versions and to understand the textual traditions of the original and back. But um, his reading instructions are not addressed to the readers of Universal Bia's work in general, but rather to the readers of his copy. Um, he seems to be given instructions to those who would turn this messy manuscript into a clean, fair copy. So was he understood? So well, uh, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, uh, Müller was confused by a copy that he found of uh, Ibn Abisari's uh, work in Cambridge. So this is the, the one that you see in the, in the image. It's uh, Manuscript Oriental 1461, which is a late copy from the 18th century, so 1724. Um, it's a late copy, but it's interesting for the sake of comparison because it's a direct copy of Shahid Ali Pasha. So this is a copy of the messy manuscript that I've been discussing. And as you can see in these two images, uh, there's no mess here. So it's a running text perfectly laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems that, that he was following the, the author's instructions and he put all the biographies in, in order. I have not studied this manuscript in detail, but it seems that he follows the, the proper order as marking 
in the other text. And then not only that, the copies of the Cambridge manuscript also describes in the colophon the manuscript tradition from which his copy derives, reproducing the wording of the Shehid Ali Pasha colophon. And he, at the left side of the screen, you see the colophon of the Cambridge manuscript, which says, I wrote this copy, that is the Cambridge copy, from a copy, so the other one, Shehid Ali Pasha, which had been written from a copy of the author. This refers to the main body text and collated with the author's draft, which is the, the draft of the of Inari Sabia that appears in the margins, the additions in the margins. So you have the entire tradition summarized in this little colophon at the very end. Um, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the copies of this Cambridge manuscript, he, he was able to understand all, the, all these instructions. He also copied the explanatory marginal note that I discussed before, and he added this as a pasted uh, leaf to his, to his manuscript. Um, this is the reference to the, to the draft that uh, Muller read. And as you can imagine, if you read this in a perfectly clean manuscript, it doesn't make any sense. So you cannot understand what these references to the Musawada and, and these different levels of the, of the text mean if you don't have the mess of, of Shahid Ali Pasha. So when you have only a clean manuscript, it's very difficult to, to understand. It doesn't make sense. And that's why Mueller was really confused. And if you read the, 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 the study of the textual tradition that he wrote, you really feel that he was struggling to understand what was the meaning of that. He talks about the, uh, the draft, he calls it the bouillon, but uh, he could not grasp what, he, what the, the, this uh, interleaf pasted there meant. And of course, it's, it's impossible to, to know if you don't have the, the other manuscripts. Um, also, as, as a curiosity, um, the copies of the Cambridge manuscript also reproduce the, the marginal notes added that the copies of Shahid Ali Pasha. So, uh, I said before that at the beginning of the, of the book, before the margins are occupied by, by the additions, he added some, some marginal notes. Well, they are also reproduced in the Cambridge Manuscript Library manuscript. This is not uh, an oddity. Yeah, I've seen this in many, in many manuscripts. Um, in fact, uh, many of the manuscripts of the uh, Ibn uh, text that we use for the edition, for the real edition, have uh, many additions, marginal notes, referring to, to other sources just to stress one point in the text or to comment on something. And we actually edited all of them and uh, translated all of them. So that you can, if you're interested, you're, they are in the, in the last volume of, uh, of the edition. So to conclude, so manuscripts such as Shahid Ali Pasha uh, 1923 revealed not only scribal but also scholarly practices. So the study of the paratexts in this manuscript shows that the copies was well acquainted with the medical literary tradition to which uh, Ibn Abi Shabia belongs. He was probably a physician himself, but he was also, he was also concerned about the integrity of the text and the work. Um, that is why he relied. He tried to restore the the author's uh, original text from what he believed to be a summary or a defective copy. That why he was uh, so thorough giving instructions and copying all the new information and giving references to the, to the order of these, of these uh, biographies in the margins and in his comments. So copies and scholars search for authoritative, authoritative text, ideally autographs as happens with the copies of Sheikh Ali Pasha. So the main body text was based ultimately in an, an autograph. It was a copy of the author's uh, copy. And then you have the, the manuscript used for collation, which was a draft of the, of the copy himself, of the author himself in his handwriting. So he looked for authoritative, authoritative text and autographs. And um, 
And many of these copyists and scholars, they also try to find out in which institutions were these manuscripts held, that we have seen in the example of Ibn Jumai that I discussed at the very beginning. So he asked about uh, Ibn Sina's uh, Qanun and the different versions of the text that circulated in, in Iraq, and uh, especially if they were, if they could be traced to, to the author himself and in which institutions were they held, the madrasas or, or mosques. So that's why I think that we should pay attention to this set of practices that I have named culture of collation uh, from a comprehensive perspective, because it involves different parties. It involves authors who want to control their works, sometimes with wax, where you can deposit a, a book as a wax, and in theory, it cannot be removed from that institution. Um, it involves also the institutions that hold these, these works, madrasas, uh, libraries, uh, and uh, mosques. And it involves the copies and readers who search and demand for these authoritative texts. Um, the Sahihali Pasha copy of Ibn Abi Usay Bi Yun is, I think, a perfect example of that. And I hope that, that it, it's clear what I was meaning. Thank you. <laughs>